be a brief introduction. Back in 1997, uh, Lily uh, founded the uh, Tahiri Justice Center, uh, which she ran for uh, over 20 years. Had uh, the possibility to to protect over 32,000 uh, women and uh, and girls throughout her journey. Thank you for everything that you have been doing. The organization uh, grew massively. Uh, during your leadership. Lily was having a very meaningful career uh, in the Tyree Justice Center and now made a shift uh, after 20 years. So I would like together with you guys to explore uh, also the possibility of making a shift in career. We already have very two exciting questions from our group. Thank you so much. I had two questions. The first one is about how much sacrifice was it needed to do to impact 30,000 women in this situation? Like, you know, quite often I see in careers in mind that in order to go for impact and meet the needs, you have to sacrifice market value and finances or, or how, how did this appear to you? And the second one is about how to find the right timing for seasons of life. Like you made a big change, I guess, from CEO operations, driving the growth, the team to be a mentor and an advisor in different roles and how to find the right balance. So in terms of sacrifice, there are ways in which it was a sacrifice and ways in which it was entirely selfish. And I think that... um, you know, so many meaningful things are both all at the same time. Um, There are elements of sacrifice. So one element is financial. You mentioned that. I founded the Tahereh Justice Center as I was graduating from law school. And the reason for that was because I had been involved in a case that received, it helped to set legal precedent in the United States around the issue of whether or not someone could receive asylum because of gender rather than other definitions of a refugee like political persecution and religion, these kinds of things. Gender was not in the legal definition of a refugee. So when I argue that case, uh, it was in the press a lot. I was in the press a lot. Um, <clears throat> then it, 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 it changed the law and then that also got attention. And so then there was attention on two fronts. One was as a result of all of that, there was attention by women and girls who needed my help. They, they, they perceived me as someone who could help them after that case. So I was getting a lot of very heartbreaking phone calls. The other was, um, there was commercial interest. So, um, movies, TV shows, and books, they were interested in buying the rights to kind of the story of a law student helping a young woman who then changed the law. And I, though, professionally, it was unwise for me to do any of that. So I um, had some really, because I was just graduating from law school, and to have one um, kind of high profile case does not make you a good lawyer. It makes you lucky. (laughs) And, you know, having had one impactful experience, but it's not I needed more consistent professional development, um, you know, before uh, feeling like that was a wise thing to do. And I had, again, wise mentors who reminded me, they're like, you don't know how to manage people. You don't really know how to be a lawyer. You know nothing about nonprofit management or fundraising, like all of these things that would be really helpful. And so they, um, I had, I had mentors around me who really told me straight, they were brutally honest with me. And they, in turn, also helped me kind of do other things. So for four years, I was a corporate attorney, and I worked for a very large law firm, one of the top law firms in the United States that represented large corporations and uh, governments. I also worked for the Justice Department, but I didn't stay there very long because it was a conflict of interest for me to do publicity for the book. Um, because because the publicity required me to publicly criticize the U.S. immigration system. And obviously the U.S. Department of Justice had a real problem with a low level, <laughs> entry level lawyer in the Justice Department publicly criticizing the U.S. immigration system. So I, I it became clear I couldn't stay in my job. So then I went to the law firm. Um, and so I, I mentioned that only because when I was at the law firm, I was making way more money than I was worth. 
And, and, you know, it's, it was like insane, pretty much what they were paying us. And, um, and I knew that, and I knew that my long game was not to be in the for-profit legal sector. And so I was um, saving 80% of my salary. And um, so every month I would take my paycheck, 80% of it would go into savings. Um, I also, uh, maybe more information than you need, but at the time I was also going through a divorce. So, um, but he was a physician and, um, and it became also clear to me that if I wanted to do nonprofit work in the way I needed, I needed to do a lot of engineering in the beginning uh, or financially. So, so what I, I ended up getting the house <laughs> in the divorce. So what I, what I ended up doing is renting out every single room in my house. So it had four bedrooms. I, and, and it was such a blessing because I ended up making the best friends ever. These people who threw the newspaper became my roommates <laughs> ended up being like, like, I feel like the universe was just so supportive <laughs> and helpful basically. So I ended up, I saved during my year of, of patients, kind of a, a period of, of before my divorce, 80% of my salary. I then rented out every room in my house. And I was able then to make the shift to the nonprofit sector in a way that wasn't too financially burdensome, basically, because I had kind of lined up these different mechanisms. And it became clear, or it, it is clear to me that in the nonprofit sector, people have to be paid. I mean, um, I, I will say it was a growth for me. It was a learning for me because I had engineered my life in this way. And so I was willing to take a financial sacrifice in a way that was unfair to ask other people to do. So I was paying myself below market salary. And, um, but we were hiring women of color, people who were single mothers, people who did not have the kind of engineering that I had uh, financially, had they had loans, they had, you know, all these things. And so it was actually a real learning moment for me when I was CEO. Um, th there were hard conversations that other people had to have with me to basically say what I thought was like martyrdom self-sacrifice around my salary was creating an inequitable and uh, unsustainable dynamic in the organization. Um, I remember actually my, and I was paying other people more than I was making, kind of thinking that was the right thing to do. And what I learned was that it made people feel bad. And I, and I had, you know, my deputy director who saw the budget and saw everything, who when she learned that she was making more money than I, came into my office and was like, this really makes me angry. And I just need to tell you, you know, it was like a very honest conversation. And so, so when you say sacrifice, yes, there are sacrifices, but I actually think as leaders, we have to be careful about that because then it imposes sacrifice on other people in ways that aren't fair, if that makes sense. Uh, so I'm talking financially right now, but I can also speak about work-life balance. So I came from a large law firm who expected 60 hours a week from people. That was the environment I was used to. I was used to not seeing daylight, you know, during the week. And, and, um, and I had an ethic that I think people can call, I don't know if you're familiar with this phrase, white supremacy culture, but a lot of people are really critiquing now what are kind of white corporate male dominated uh, approaches to work. And I had been trained in that environment. And so I brought some of that. So I was sending emails to people at one o'clock in the morning. I was sending emails over the weekend, you know, like that was how I was used to working. And again, I was used to like a work ethic around sacrificing balance for the sake of the work, getting the work done. That was another learning for me professionally. I had to learn that that was unfair. It was unfair to people who were balancing children. It was unfair to people, you know, it was all of these kinds of things. So I, I share that with you because yes, I was sacrificing in kind of ways that I thought were admirable that ended up hurting the the people I worked with, if that makes sense. So I don't I don't know that it's great to sacrifice all that much. Like there's pride in sacrificing. And I learned over the course of time 
that what's better is to model commitment that's reasonable that you want other people to model. So I think reasonable commitment is good. As sacrifice on that level can create burden, burnout, uh, feelings of resentment. Um, if you're in a leadership position, I mean, it's fine if you're in a bubble and nobody really cares and you're just sacrificing for yourself. But I think when you're a leader and you're modeling that, it, it, that, that level of sacrifice can become uh, problematic actually. I think the one level of sacrifice that I don't know what to do about is the emotional toll. And so I think, you know, we've talked about work ethic, work-life balance, financial, all of those kinds of sacrifices that, again, I actually now looking back and, and fortunately learned early in is probably not even helpful to creating a sustainable work environment. But the other piece is emotional sacrifice. And, you know, we worked with clients in trauma who needed a lot and who distrusted almost everyone who tried to help them because of real lived experience. So it was unappreciated, thankless, hard, hard, hard work. Then you're also in a system that is unfair. Um, and then you're working with other people who are also in trauma. You know, everyone who works in social justice, domestic violence, everyone has their own story, why they come to that work and why they care so much about it. And so there was also a lot of emotional kind of sacrifice that, that also I think had to be really carefully managed so that one didn't burn out. So, um, so, but then I, I also don't want to leave the topic of sacrifice without talking about the selfish benefits. Um, you know, I, I, I was daily inspired by the people that I worked with and their commitment and, and their sacrifices. I was daily inspired by the clients, by the staff, um, derived a lot of personal satisfaction um, you know, at times undeserved recognition for that. Um, you know, so there was a lot of kind of benefit and and um, pride that came from it. So I don't I don't want to overly uh, emphasize the sacrifice piece. Um, okay, your second question you mentioned, and I'm not sure I'm going to get this right, but like shifting from doing a lot of a little as opposed to focus maybe was kind of the nature of the question. So I always did a lot of a little, to be clear. My job was, was a very, um, and I've actually learned now in, 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 now I'm in more control of my life than I was when I was CEO. When I was CEO, my calendar was populated for me. Like I, I was reactive. Every It was about everyone's needs, other people's deadlines, um, thunder demands, board needs, client emergencies, staff concerns. You know, it was always reactive what I, what I did. But I, I was in a lot of places all at once often. Then when I left Tahare and had the opportunity to focus, I realized I was so used to doing a lot of a little that it was driving me crazy, actually, to only focus on one thing in the day. And I wasn't good at it. I re I, I, I kind of didn't fully appreciate that about myself, but I have maybe it's a little ADHD qualities or kind of I love the diversity of doing so I've actually realized my days are most productive when I block them in hour increment increments and I'm doing this and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing this and then I can come back to that but if I have a block of eight hours where I'm doing one thing I figure out ways to unproductively divert <laughs> my attention in ways that um so anyway so I, I think the bottom line is I like to do a lot of a little and I love you know jumping from thing to thing and I like intensity. Thank you for sharing all this learning. I mean, through, throughout 20 years of experience, you must have learned so much. Werner, if you would like to articulate more and maybe share also your personal experience in that. When you are a CEO, you are in, in charge and some sometimes you have the power to decide things and, and, and give the direction where you want to go things. Whereas as a consultant, you can show the direction, but if your if your client wants to go that that road, um, is uh, sometimes sometimes it it works out, sometimes it doesn't. How do you cope with this shift of um, 
of, of I would say power or, or uh, power of decision. I understand um, exactly what you're saying. I, I think for me, it was power I was eager to give up, to be honest. I um, I was tired. <laughs> I was really tired of waking up in the middle of the night, wonder, you know, like the, the burden of, of that power was deeply felt by me. And, you know, the fact that our clients' lives depended on my wisdom and choices, um, that our staff's livelihoods and well-being depended on me. It, and and I, I had burned out. I was, you know, and I was trying to get out of my job for about three years actively. And um, I had internal successors that I was, I was really cultivating and uh, one in particular who's just amazing, amazing. And I knew could do my job and could do it better than me. And I just knew that she was really wonderful. And I had been asking her for two years straight if she would take my job. And she kept saying like, hard, no, <laughs> I see what you do. I don't want to do that. You know, she saw the pressure. The fundraising was so burdensome and the, you know, the public scrutiny. I mean, I had death threats and, you know, then people periodically would just decide they hate me for different reasons, you know, and it was all symbolic, like you're symbolic basically. And, you know, and, and she not, not, I don't blame her. She saw a lot of that and she was like, no, thank you. I, you know, I'm not actually interested in, in the heat that you take and all of that. Um, and then something shifted. I won't go into the details, but she basically kind of saw well, okay, there's there's something that shifted on her end, but there was something I think that had more of an influence. So basically I wrote, and for some of you who are Baha'is, I you'll know that I wrote the Universal House of Justice, which was the is the international governing body of the Baha'is. And I basically begged them out. I said, I want out. <laughs> And I don't know how. And that was my letter. I basically was like, I really, um, you know, for the following reasons, I feel, and you know, I kind of framed it professionally, you know, for personal, professional growth reasons, I would like to move on, do something different. Uh, and for institutional health reasons, I really don't think it's wise. I believe in leadership longevity. I think that's healthy for an organization, but 20 years was feeling like too much for the health of any organization. Like it's healthy, I think, to have transition in leadership. And um, and I and I, I asked for their guidance on how to most wisely make the shift. Um, particularly, asked some questions around being a Baha'i-inspired organization, which we were, and how to best shift leadership in light of that. All of that kind of thing. They wrote back, and it was a very kind, like they had some suggestions, ideas, but then they had a statement in there that said, it was very sweet because my letter to them was very professional. I was trying to be all professional. But then they wrote back and they said, do not uh, do not be anxious. Tahere, or do not have anxiety. And they used the word <laughs> anxiety or anxious. Um, Tahere, regardless of, of whether you are leading it or not in the future, will always continue to serve and protect women flip facing violence. For me, that kind of like, it's going to be okay from them <laughs> meant everything. And exactly two weeks after I received that letter, Archie, this individual I'm mentioning, came into my office and said, okay, now I think I'm ready. And I was like, ah, I thank you, thank you. Like I knew it was the prayers. <laughs> I basically kind of worked that out. So I gave her two weeks because I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? Because you've said no for a really long time. Are you sure? Because I'm going to, you know, give my notice. You've got two weeks to change your mind. <laughs> and other than that, I'm so, so that's what happened. And then we had, a, I, I think, a really beautiful transition, a four month transition. I stayed then for nine more months to support her make sure that, you know, transfer relationships, finish a lot of big think projects. And then we ended up losing most of our C team to the Biden administration, um, who you know, are all experts in their field and ended up going into the administration. So then she needed me to be the acting COO, the acting chief program officer, because she had to replace these positions. So it was, I think, really good to support her in that transition. I did not mind losing the power. I was so grateful to give it up, so grateful. Now, I will tell you that that uh, the, the harder part 
was, and, and this is where I think ego plays in, was like loss of identity. So it wasn't the power or the decision-making role that I had, but it was kind of loss of identity. And part of this had to do with the fact that I wanted to change my identity it, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to run another nonprofit. Um, and, and so I wanted to go into social impact work and I felt like corporate leverage, particularly with the ESG movement was the next frontier. And I really wanted to go back to the corporate sector. I had that background and I wanted to support companies in their human rights and in their ESG efforts. But my resume didn't look good for that. I wasn't really qualified. So I found myself going from industry leader to entrant, industry entrant <laughs> into the field. And I think that was harder. That was a little harder from kind of an ego perspective. Um, but but also, I mean, I get it because that's not what I have expertise in. So I'm learning and I'm growing in that area. But but I, I'd say that was harder. Giving up the power that um, was not, I was so grateful to not have that power anymore. And even from the day we, I'd say like the week we transferred, you know, when, when, when Archie became COO and then with, within a few weeks, I had to become two of her C-level positions. Technically, I had more work and technically I managed more humans than I did when I was CEO from a direct report perspective. But I didn't, I didn't mind the hours. I, 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 but the burden, the like weight off my shoulders when I wasn't CEO anymore. Oh, so grateful. <laughs> loved it so that was not so, hard was it would you say that was that burden the burden of that power and that tiredness that was the trigger to make the change and how in in parallel because it took you three years actually to make that change or maybe more um uh, how did you get uh, to identify what to do next the trigger for the change had to do with me feeling like it was healthy for the organization um, I always, I had an arbitrary, you know, 20 years was always in my mind too much. I always, and I realized I was approaching that. Um, and I also professionally didn't want this to be the only thing I ever did. Like, I, I think that there is a point of no return professionally. And I had already been doing it for 20 years. Um, I'm 50 years old. Like, I felt like if I'm going to do something else, to have like a second chapter, I need to make that shift now. And I, and I watched colleagues who did not shift earlier, just really have a hard time reinventing themselves. And I felt like I still had an opportunity to do that and, and wanted to take that. Um, I think the burnout, like the piece around exhaustion and giving up power that happened later, actually. So when I first made the decision, I wasn't in that mental space for me, it was, it was just a proactive, like, I think this is the right thing to do for the organization professionally. But by the end, you know, we had been through pandemic and, and I think there were dynamics that changed. Um, and by the end, I was just like grateful <laughs> to, to, to kind of have a break from those responsibilities. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. And how did you identify on the way that consulting was exactly what you you meant to do in the second phase, you know, of your career. Yeah. I well, I think that's that's a very ambitious uh, assertion that I'm even sure that's the right thing to do. I'm not. I'm still in process to be clear um, about that. I think what I decided or what I thought I wanted to do was an in-house corporate job around ESG, and I I began applying for those, but. But then it became clear to me I wasn't qualified yet for that, that I still had a lot of work to do in order to be qualified. Um, you know, and, and it's a strange thing because I know like I know the head of human rights at Coca-Cola. I know the head of human rights at Hewlett Packard. You know, and I I said very frankly to them, I'm like, how do I get your job? Like, that's exactly what I want to do, you know? And they were like, well, okay, first of all, there are only 30 of us in the world. Like, they're pretty much, this is a very small community, and there are only a handful of companies that really have that job. And they said, but it's really through the portal of ESG work generally that then the, the corporate human rights piece fits under the S, you know, component particularly. 
Um, and so, you know, their advice was develop expertise around that. And so I took a Berkeley Law class around ESG. Then I developed a course and I taught that course on Udemy around ESG. And then, so what has happened has been not, I think, a grand design, but has been a little bit more default. And it has been um, just doing what people are hiring me to do. And so it's become a lot of ESG training. Um, and then that one leads to another and leads to another and leads to another. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, a few people have asked me to do executive coaching around like operationalizing their values as a manager, which is something I know well, given the work that we did at Tahare. And so now I have found myself with several coaching kind of executive advising clients. So it, I, I wouldn't say it's been a grand, and I think this is true for career generally, you pick something like a focal point or a direction based on what you think you wanna do. And then you start moving in that direction and what's meant to be then happens. And it's not what you thought. It's very rarely what you thought. And so I think I'm in that process now. I don't feel baked. I don't feel done. I don't feel like it's decided. Um, but then the little pieces of movement all along the way um, I think, you know, having a lot of people give advice, um, Daniel has been incredibly helpful, you know, little things from what do you think about this training or what do you think, you know, there was another person who I said, look, somebody is asking me for a proposal to help their company operationalize their values. Here's my process and here's my expertise, but how do I frame that? And so then another individual who worked for a big consulting company wrote my pitch for me. <laughs> I was like so grateful, you know. So people have been so helpful and I I'm I I'm endlessly grateful for the lots of little advice I'm getting from people all along the way feedback on my website, you know, lots of little things like that, but I think it it would be wrong and um an overstatement to say that I somehow was super clear on what I should do next and perfectly strategized around that, because that's not true. <laughs> I was not clear, I had a sense of direction and then started to pursue it. But then I think there have been, and will probably continue to be intervening forces that guide me. I'm very human as well, uh, I would say. I think we have touched on this point many times throughout the webinars that very often we feel this, uh, this pressure, you know, to find a purpose and then stick to it throughout your whole career, right? Taking into account that life change, priority change, the, the purpose itself may change, you know? And so very often we have difficulties to, to adapt to that. I find it exciting, the idea that you can still reinvent yourself. Uh, I would like to give the words to Nan. So I think advocating justice as a woman has been I would say always a very admirable and uh, courageous act, uh, which also I think you did a wonderful job and setting a really a great example for also many women girls <laughs> to stand for their justice uh, in sometimes of a very unseemly, uh, let's say, justified world. So what do you think of uh, as your, your advantage or as a woman in such situations when being perceived as vulnerable and Maybe not that being, you know, um, sometimes being overlooked or sometimes that happened a lot in the working environment. So what do you think? But however, as the, which is the nature of women, uh, that that helps um, this environment to, you know, to be justified and what is the, the advantage of women and advocating justice? I think there are advantages to all genders advocating for justice. Um, I think that, you know, as a woman working on women's issues with other women, I was able to bring a connection and understanding and a, a level of support that um, for somebody who has faced trauma and a lot of pain, it can be hard to trust. And so as a woman, that was an advantage. Um, at the same time, we would advocate for male attorneys to join us and be a part of the work because in the same way that a female client might trust another woman more, it may be very valuable for her to learn to trust a man and to have a man in her corner as her advocate. And that might be the first time she's ever experienced that. Mm -hmm. And so there, there also is real benefit to that. 
I think that as women and their studies around this, we may see things as more interconnected and holistic. And so there is maybe an, an, an advantage in how we advocate for justice around that. But, you know, men also bring benefits to that. I think society will sometimes provide credibility to men in ways that, um, you know, women don't have. And so I don't know. I, I, I think that the partnership is probably what's most helpful is uh, for both men and women to be engaged in it. I, in the United States, there is, I think, an unhelpful dominance of women in the nonprofit sector. And often it's because men are focused on for-profit endeavors and making money. And then women are, and maybe it's because, you know, they have partners who can support them. You know, for me, I had financial um, advantage that I could bring to sacrificing the salary to do the work. But the result is the nonprofit sector is very female. And um, and I, I, I don't think, I think there should be balance. I think there should be balance. And there should be more men who are advocating for justice um, for the benefit of, of all of society, but also because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. So we are approaching almost the end, the time flies. But uh, I, I know that Alisa and your group had uh, one last question, right? What was the biggest lesson you learned from your pivot, Laylee? And have you incorporated the arts at all into your new role? Oh, those are two really, I don't have great answers to either of those questions. <laughs> I'm so sorry. First of all, I'm not very artistic. I'm I'm just horrible, horrible. And um, love and soak up other people who are. <laughs> so that's, I, I admire and, and love that. And I'm the shadow, I'm the puppy to people who are artistic. Um, I think, um, it, it, the biggest thing I have learned, I've I've just learned a ton of things. I've learned a lot of things about myself. Uh, I think some of the things I reflected on earlier, what am I good at? What do I really enjoy? Because I think for so much, um, a lot of what I've been doing has been reactive and in response to what's needed rather than uh, I have, haven't had the bandwidth to kind of think through what I want or prefer or or what I'm good at. So that's been really interesting to explore, and I've really enjoyed that. Um, this, this is, I don't know, this is coming to me, and I'm like pushing it out of my brain, but I'll just say it because it keeps coming back into my brain. One of my biggest lessons is how I want more time with my kids, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I think, you know, I traveled a lot, and I was, you know, I just was dealing with so much so often, and um, I think the timing has been perfect. My older two are very independent and strong-minded and, and, you know, I've been there for them. My younger one actually has some health issues and some special needs. And, and I feel like I never want to go back to a job like I had before for his sake, um, because I'm really seeing how important that has been for him. Um, so that's been one of my biggest learnings, but it's not like career professional advice, but I, I think that Having that time uh, and and having the uh, well the, the bandwidth or you know the time to to have better perception around that has been really helpful, and I I don't want to lead you with like I wasn't I don't think I was I was ever a neglectful parent I was actually very engaged, and my older two in fact like the one time I took a sabbatical I did take a sabbatical. And because I'm very intense, like with everything. And I remember my older one was like, mom, when are you going back to work? You need to go back to work. <laughs> this is like, I was too much in their lives, apparently. So my older ones, it worked out very well. But my younger one just has some different needs. So I'm grateful for being able to be more present. Very, very quick, quick question about because letting go. Interesting. You mentioned how that letter of the House of Justice really gave you permission to let go. I would love just very briefly if you could share something about because I have a problem letting go, uh, just trusting mm -hmm. it will be okay, trusting it will be a good decision as opposed to really thinking through all the steps to take a good decision. If you could briefly just touch on that, allowing and letting go. <laughs> oh gosh, I, I'm not. I'm the worst person really <laughs> to give that advice. I'm not. I'm not good at letting go. I I, I would say though. Um, well, from a control perspective, I mean, from a management perspective, early on, I learned that if, if the people I worked with, I trusted, I could let go of it a lot, a lot. And 
And that was a learning experience for me. And, um, and I would say like my last 10 years at Tahere, it was a very well-oiled machine around um, what I knew I was good at, what I knew I needed to delegate, but check. And what I knew I just needed to do myself, like kind of knowing that balance around micromanagement control and different things like that. Um, I, that's a whole nother, it's really a management topic, I think, but but there's something there. I, I let go of a lot because we had great processes in place and we had wonderful people who were executing them. On like almost a personal, like detachment level, um, I could delegate, but still care a lot about something. I, I don't I don't know that um, detachment is about not caring. So I think this is the this is the journey that I've been on. Um, is is trusting and letting go? Does that mean I don't care? Because for me, that was my mechanism to let go. I almost like had to decide I didn't care, and that if I didn't care, then I could let go. <laughs> but it was really hard for me to care and let go all at the same time. And there, there is a story that I'll, I'll just share. I don't know if, you know, if it's helpful at all, but that I read about Abdul Baha that really helped me in this regard. Um, he, there was a, so Abdul Baha, who's the son of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith and is really looked to as an example. Um, there was a period in his life where he shouldered, uh, well, he shouldered a lot of burden throughout his whole life, but there was a period where it was a particularly heavy burden in managing the Baha'i community during a time when his father had just passed away. And during this time, his um, siblings really undermined him, like they stole resources and they stole belongings. They wrote letters that were lies to leaders in order to get Abdul Baha uh, arrested. They tried to poison him four times. Like it was like hardcore sabotage <laughs> is what was going on. Um, and this went on intensely for about four years. And um, during that time, Abdul Baha would receive visitors from around the world. And those visitors did not perceive any stress on his part. Like they, they couldn't perceive, you know, he had an ability to compartmentalize and I guess, you know, be detached and be calm and be generous and courteous and giving and loving to all the people around him, even though he was going through a lot. And, but one of the pilgrims who would visit um, told the story that during this time period, you know, he was very available for everybody else. But then at night, they heard him wailing. They, they, and like, so not only like maybe quietly sobbing or praying, but wailing loud. And I have to imagine he knew people could hear him because like, I have to imagine he was, you know, perceptive enough. I know if I was wailing in my bedroom, I would know that the house would hear me, right? So apparently he would wail and cry out in pain and anguish and kind of like praying to God, asking for mercy from all of these tests and all of these difficulties. What, what the, I was so grateful to read that story because what that told me was he was not without pain. Like he was not a sociopath who basically had no feelings about things. He, he did not not care about what was happening. He just put it in its place. And for me, that was so helpful because it helped me realize, okay, I don't have to not care. It's like, okay to care <laughs> or I don't have to not be in pain or have feelings about this. It's okay. It's just that I need to kind of put it in its place and make sure that I'm managing it properly. I don't know if that makes sense, but for me, cause like, and, and that was maybe my problem where I was like, wait, detachment means I, I need to not care or I need to not be affected. I need to not be hurt or not have feelings. When I read that story, I thought, oh, okay, maybe detachment is just about time and place, like dealing with it in the right way at the right time, if that makes sense. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Laili, for uh, all those insights and, and learnings uh, about <laughs> what you need, you know, the realization of what you needed along the way. Mm -hmm.